Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Veronica Pedroza and I'm with the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights and we're so happy to be able to organize this. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to discuss these very important events. What we're going to do is divide the next hour into two distinct sections. The first part will uh, focus on the fact that today is actually the death anniversary of Angel Jal Sin, who many people around the world heard about when she was um, killed in the act of protesting against the military junta. Uh, we, I will hand over to our chair, Charles Santiago, Malaysian MP and chair, as I say, of ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. Over to you, Charles. Thanks, thanks, Veronica. Uh, can you hear me? Can, you can hear me, right? Yes? Yes, thank you. Ah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, well, let me just welcome all of you uh, and those who are listening at home. Um, this is an important briefing uh, that we at APHR hope and push for the humanitarian action that people in Myanmar desperately need. Um, ASEAN has a crucial role to play in ensuring that the Myanmar military and its aligned groups refrain from using further violence and ensure that democracy is upheld and the will of the people of Myanmar is respected. However, since ASEAN reached its five-point consensus uh, last April, there has been almost no progress. And I don't have to go into the details of the progress because it's nothing really has happened, except uh, diplomats wasting money on flying from one capital to the other. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that uh, the, the uh, uh, military government of Myanmar has allowed the, uh, the Cambodian special envoy to visit uh, uh, Myanmar in the next days. Uh, as part of the political dialogue or commitment made under the five-point consensus. But interestingly, that dialogue uh, will not have uh, NLD or will not uh, involve Aung San Suu Kyi uh, part of the process. Now, this defeats the purpose of having that dialogue because the dialogue was supposed to open up discussions with a variety of groups, almost all the groups that are contesting for power uh, within the country itself. Uh, and, and, and NLD is the government that was chosen to lead the country uh, two years ago. So here again, we are stranded. We are asking, we are stranded. When you, when the leader of the, leader of the government itself is under uh, uh, house arrest and unable to talk to the special envoy. So again, the question is, is this going forward or is this another waste of time? Now the fourth point uh, of, the, uh, of the consensus, five point consensus is to provide humanitarian assistance through the AHA Center. Uh, and we have former chairperson of the AHA Center here. And I must say, I, I heard her presentation, I think two weeks or two or three weeks ago uh, at the Westminster Forum. And I was very impressed at what she had to say. So I think we should really look forward to her presentation and the argument that she had uh, presented. So um, as far as ASEAN has handed over uh, this far, one uh, USD 1.1 million worth of medical supplies and equipment in, in August, that was for immediate support for the COVID response. Uh, also, especially involved the ASEAN chair in Myanmar at the time, urged the international community to continue giving support and complement ASEAN's efforts saying, provision of humanitarian assistance is a true reflection of the ASEAN way and demonstrate our commitment to help our ASEAN family when they are in need. Now, this is a major uh, st statement that will take you two days to dissect. What is this ASEAN way and the ASEAN family? Uh, because when you take the humanitarian assistance into a conflict region, the question that you ask will be, is the AHA Center available and ready to manage its provisioning of uh, humanitarian assistance in a conflict center, in a conflict environment, where you only have the army waiting for you to help you? How is that going to work? Uh, I'll let the experts deal with that. Part. But I think the point that we are raising is that this is a problem. Uh, and, um, and, um, and 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 um, Myanmar needs the money, but as well as to get the money to the people that need it most, uh, and including those who are in the border areas and so on and so forth. So I think this is something that we really have to uh, uh, look at. Um, so this far, so, the, so far we have not heard anything substantial coming out from the ASEAN leaders, including the special envoy, on the humanitarian aid. Nothing substantial 
nothing important for us to, uh, to consider saying that after a year and a half, yes, there is a flow of uh, humanitarian support. There's a flow of medicine. There's a flow, flow of vaccination. You can see it's coming from one off from countries like China uh, in, the, in the border areas and so on and so forth. So therefore, I think this is really uh, uh, something that we really have to look at and bring attention to. Otherwise, the, uh, people are going to suffer even more than they already are. Um, so I think uh, I will not say more, but I want to also say something about uh, the uh, um, angel, Mark Yalsin. I think that's how her name is pronounced. Now, the, uh, and I say this in, especially now since the next, the next days, so on the 8th of March, we celebrate um, the International uh, Women's Day. And the New York Times uh, said, that uh, Angel Mark Yeltsin loved Taekwondo, spicy food, and good red lipstick. Uh, and if you see her image, I think that you will see in a short while, you can see how strong uh, the red lipstick is though. Now, she was a young woman, very young woman, and was only 19 years of age, with lots, and hope, lots of hopes and lots of aspirations for herself, her community, and for her country. But as you know, she was shot dead by the Myanmar Security Forces a few days uh, triggering a few days after the coup d'etat, uh, triggering a huge outcry, not only in Myanmar, but also outside of Myanmar. And on, for her funeral, thousands of people, thousands of people uh, uh, paid, uh, came to pay a final farewell to her. Uh, and it also was a place where the countries, she became the icon of civil disobedience uh, since then. So I think basically, a 19-year-old woman with lots of hope for the country can be transformed into an uh, uh, icon of civil disobedience. So this is another kind of uh, answer which is in the making. But I also must say that we have many angels all over the world, uh, be it women who fight against patriarchy, the single mothers who soldier on despite poverty and a lack of resources, guided only by the fierce determination to educate their children. The, uh, so I, I think, uh, and we have women who take ceiling glasses journalists who die pushing stories, women artists who speak truth to power, and our mothers, and the list goes on. And as I sit thinking about the International Women's Day, I realize that we are celebrating, is what we are celebrating is the courage to be, the courage to be, the courage to continue doing what they believe in despite the system that's created to favor and support the male species. Uh, Angel did the same. She took to the streets to show leadership, to show resistance to the Myanmar security forces and the country's most hated man, General, General Min Ong Lai, who orchestrated the coup, if you're familiar. Thousands of women uh, uh, protested next to her, clearly signaling the crumbling of patriarchy that generals were fond of preaching. Just like them, we see women rise up against tyranny and oppression all over the world. So in pledging solidarity on the first year of Indil Mark Yeltsin's anniversary, death anniversary, I choose to challenge and call out gender bias and inequality. And I choose to celebrate uh, their courage, especially Angel's courage and strength as, she, as we celebrate the first year of her death anniversary. So basically, as what Veronica had said, this is a two, point, uh, two part program. One is to pay homage to a lost uh, comrade, a comrade who, who was shot dead by the army. And also taking a cue from there, to look at the humanitarian problem that Myanmar is facing uh, and what we should do, what ASEAN should do, what the dialogue partner should be doing, what should the United States be doing, uh, and so on and so forth, within and without. Uh, I think this is an important, uh, it, just as political dialogue is important, human, uh, humanitarian support and relief is equally important. So here we want to get the humanitarian uh, uh, discussion going, and we've got a phenomenal uh, group of people who actually can do that, help us to, uh, bring the discussions, uh, as well as to find solutions to the problem. So on that note, I will thank you for joining us. Veronica, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Honorable Charles Santiago, Chair of APHR and Malaysian MP for Klang. Um, as Charles mentioned, it's been exactly a year since um, Angel Jal Singh uh, fell in service to the people. She stood there and she said, we will not run. She shouted at the police who were so heavily armed and, and oppressing the protesters with 
overwhelming violence. And these people were young, they were unarmed, but they believed in a future for Myanmar that did not include the military. And they continue to fight every day through all means possible. And so we can say that this coup is actually an attempted coup. They have still, because of the resistance and the courage of the people of Myanmar, not managed to control the whole country. We're very privileged to have with us today Dinza Shunle Yi, who is the founder of Sisters to Sisters and um, a youth activist, to give her message honoring Angel and all the people who have fallen. And um, we're really happy that you are here and um, can give us further um, information about what's going on and how Angel's uh, memory continues. Thank you, Shunle. You on the anniversary of the fallen hero Inja Jason, I'm honored to pay tribute to her. I'm honored to pay tribute to all my sister in the revolution. Let me speak to her directly. My dear sister Angel, you left us a year ago and we remember you in our hearts. Every day we think of you and sister like you who were murdered by soldiers for standing up and resisting this offensive coup. Angel, I want you to know that the plans the general trying to carry out have not yet succeeded. This is because of sister like you who defended democracy on the front lines in the very beginning. You risked and sacrificed everything to protect us and those without access to institution and those who struggle to make it on their own. But it has to tell you, Angel, that more than 107 women and 683 young people like yourself have been martyrs since the coup. Among those 107 martyr women, most of them were between 18 and 29 years old. Recently, a young woman, aged 23, one of the very few student unions leader, an encourages revolutionary sister was reportedly raped while in detention, sustaining several injuries. She was denied access to health care and was held in isolation for many months. Thinking of the pain and the rage she must have felt, I'm angry. I know that you will be angry too. These soldiers assume that young women like us are easy target. It has been this way for far too long, not just in our country, but all over the world. This misogynistic military coup is the only most recent manifestation of a hateful history of marginalization and suppression. If we cannot be silenced and ignore, we will be the target of their frustration and brutality. Angel, today, a year ago, you refused to be silent and ignore. Though it should never have come to this, now you are one of our heroes. You are important, you are visible. You are sister all over the country. Continue to carry you and your spirit in the revolution. But we continue to lose them as we lost you. And I wonder, are we collectively yet open and just enough to shine the same light or re recognition and visibility on our fallen sister in other ethnic and marginalized communities? On November 19, 2016, environmentalist and women's human rights defender, not Chip Bandai, was murdered in the way. And on January 19 and 20 of 2015, two Gichin volunteer teachers, Maran Luja and Tabao Kwanenshin, were brutally raped and killed by the Burmese army in Northern Shan State. We demand a justice, and we will continue to demand justice for each of us, at least for the rest of my life, to the best of my ability. The righteousness of our fight hinges on this. And most importantly, as an older sister, Angel, I will keep questioning whether our leaders in the revolution and holding recognition and representation or whether they are helping distribute it to all who are entitled to it. This week, the world is overwhelmed with the news from Ukraine and Russia. We are seeing and hearing about people losing their life, families splitting, and young people picking up guns to defend their freedom. I also see young Ukrainian women joining the armed forces, confronting aggression head on. Angel, you were martyr for civil disobedience. They kill you because you were at the protest on the front line. The tyrants of this world are unrelenting. They are in the business of crushing our hopes. If not revolution, I wonder what that is for us. 
If not for just an accountability, I wonder why would we waste our time and energy attending meetings and Zoom conferences? Angel, after you are dead, now more people tend to see the real face of the military in Myanmar. The military did have a chance to deceive all of us that they are the true guardians of democracy. They are the only institution that could bring Myanmar into a democratic transition. Now, people confidently say, the military has turned into a facet institution with facet ideology since long time ago. Now the military promised an election and many diplomats, they have that little sort of hope that they could, this could be an entry point. We loudly say there can never be a free and fair election and a military drafted constitution that failed to respect the principle of federal democracy. That is one of the goals we held most dearly for the times after our independence. Myanmar nation building process must never lose the size of Nova Endeavor. And in this regard, 2000 constitution divided us onto a dangerous detour. Bereft legitimacy, competence or public support, Myanmar military has dis disgraced itself as a serious political body, let alone one capable of organizing an election. Angel, the chart you wrote said everything will be okay. What is the sign of the naivety of optimism? The tragedy of hope? Not necessarily. You are defending democracy with your real body and soul. You could say everything will be okay because you knew that all things change. This is the wisdom of the young person. We know that we will change and we are determined to have a political system that allows us to breathe and thrive. When we hear young people say, everything will be okay, let us listen to them, let us hear their voice, and let us help them gain the representation that is their birthright. When a young woman say, everything will be okay, we can trust her. But only in so far, we are capable, capable to support, to match her courage and vision. Angel, on March 3 of 2021, I saw the bright eyes and heavy heart you had. You may have passed away, but your spirit and your clarity of purpose fuel us in our march to our goal. Your blood and by the breath caused through this revolution. My sister, you are not alone. You are not alone now. We will never be, we, you will never be forgotten um, from our sister, sister to sister campaign. So let us remember Angel today and tomorrow and every day together with all the other women whose bread were taken away as revenge for their resistance. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Shunle. That was a really beautiful and moving speech and incredibly inspiring. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you're right, we will not forget. And one of the ways we want to honor the memory of Angel is by doing as much as we can to alleviate the suffering of the people in Myanmar. And one of the crucial pieces, of course, is through ASEAN. That is why today we want to talk about how ASEAN can really deliver on providing humanitarian help. This is something that could actually save lives. Too many people have died since um, Angel passed. Why did that happen? What's gone wrong? How can it be fixed? It's a pleasure uh, to hand over to our great friend and partner with ASEAN Burma, Debbie Stottard, who will be moderating the next part of our session. Thank you, Debbie, over to you. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Charles. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. And of course, as we, we have to understand that when we acknowledge and pay homage to Angel and all the women who have continued to resist the military junta, we also have to acknowledge that women are also some disproportionately affected by the humanitarian crisis caused by the escalating violence. In the first year of the coup, there have been more armed clashes and attacks on civilians it, throughout throughout the country of Burma, Myanmar, than there were in Syria in the same period. So it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Nossa Se, the uh, General Secretary of Women's League of Burma, an alliance of 13 women's human rights organizations operating throughout the country. 
In the past year, these women's organizations have done, have had to uh, step up both humanitarian and human rights work. And, um, and so I, uh, I would invite Sersa to share with us and, and present a, a, an overview of what is happening on the ground and, um, and how communities and community-based organizations, including women's organizations are responding. But before you start your presentation, Sersa, I'm asking all, all speakers this question. When did you start paying attention to ASEAN and why? Over to you, Sessa, for the next 10 minutes. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for having me here and uh, um, get the chance to speak about the Burmart situation, especially uh, humanitarian aid crisis. So, uh, first, uh, to respond to your question, so the ASEAN um, uh, is the one also include a Burma representative there. And we have been, um, uh, how to say, uh, extend or pay attention, aware and advocate long times, more than 10 years, uh, actually focuses on the uh, women's uh, human rights violations and sexual violence in conflict and all uh, uh, just in accountability so long. But at the most, we paid attention since military coup that ASEAN I, I um, also has attention on the Burma content to discuss that come out of the, the five point consensus include the humanitarian aid assistant. So uh, this is uh, the most that we are paying attention and that uh, we hope that we have uh, or we implement the, the point that they, they agreed and they made all the, the decision. So this is the first question that I would like to uh, respond. So um, um, actually uh, the Burma content, so uh, our sister uh, has, has uh, already um, mentioned a lot and also the overview of the military coup also uh, that has mentioned a lot. So I will not focus much on that. I will most focus on the, uh, the IDP issue and the humanitarian, humanitarian crisis issued uh, through cross-border as well. So uh, actually the coup is still a uh, coup and military Hutan uh, tried to grab uh, power on 1st February 2021, more than a year later, this uh, illegal junta has still not been able to gain control of the country. Diverse uh, men and women have opposed and resist this junta all over the country. Uh, within that, uh, we estimate uh, more than 80% of a woman, uh, but a woman in the uh, populations has uh, resist the um, a military uh, coup. Uh, in many places, we have set up our own local ad administration and a white card and a, uh, such a like a pay tax or money to structure under the control of the Hotam. Uh, instead of the leases to ours, the restoring democracy, civilian rules, uh, the Huta has only stepped up violence. They continue to attack civilian with airstrike, bombing and uh, shooting and uh, killing, arresting and all the things. Uh, uh, our violence and uh, uh, commit and the crime. In the past years, almost 9,000 armed clutch against civilia in the past for existing uh, Syria and uh, Afghanistan and also Yemen. So um, uh, we have uh, been uh, in suffered or be, uh, become uh, displaced uh, uh, in, uh, in the country uh, from the civil war in many decades, over 17 years. So before the coup, over 497,000 people has been displaced. Since then, the number has grown to more than 881,000. So therefore, the, the, the uh, attempt coup uh, abuse particular as collective punishment and displacement number over four, 400,000. So it just uh, last uh, years and uh, a few months so more than a uh, duplicate uh, number of uh, prior to the coup. So we have seen a uh, reset lead uh, in current states. There are more than half of populations displaced. 
and also there's a lot of uh, human rights uh, violation and uh, IDP has uh, 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 Sen also uh, faces the human rights violations and the commit by the military. So uh, UN estimate over 14.4 million in need to assist assistance in this year, from 1 million prior to coup, half our population to fail to fall in the property this year, including over 5 million children. So what uh, CBOCS on the border are doing, so CBOCS, uh, they, they have been providing humanitarian aid, include food, water, health, uh, health care, and a sanitary packs, and baby food through the cross-border channel. The rigs being shot at on or arrested by the Hotan troops. It is important to note the international agency don't access to this area. The only the group, the CBOCSO, which is based in border and can reach there. CBOCSO have a capacity, experience, and a trust of affect population. They are once again lead the way during crisis, even in the past many decades. In partnership with the local actor and also a medical and a current network in San Boma, they are also saving life with a leader's resources and a, a great uh, personal risk. But they are uh, here also in snow in uh, the CBO and CSO need concrete action from the international community, especially in neighbor country, to stop a military uh, violations and also address human rights humanitarian aid crisis. So in this in that case, women are disproportionately uh, impacted by the displacement. Pregnant women are forced to give birth in harrowing uh, condition as women struggle to assess family planning and health care service for safe uh, pregnancy and childbirth. A pregnant woman who had a beast displaced over time suffered a miscarriage during her seven month while suffer from physical exhaustion and trauma. IDP are suffering from a, a secreted of a full assistant. And the Hotan continue ice strike and a bombing and a shelly. Moreover, to block eight routes, preventing the distribution of urgent food and a shelter and a medicine and a dignity pack to meet a woman's uh, maceration needs. Airstrike and Shelly have pushed thousands of people to Thai border as well. Refugee flee to uh, violence and that uh, you may have seen in the past and in the new from the new states, Thai authority pushed them back when they tried to cross the border. So even now, so um, we have heard through to IDP, even they want to cross, if the airstrike or the fighting, if not worse, they can't even cross. They have to be in the other side of the cross, uh, the river side. So Thai, Thai Burma uh, government, uh, sorry, Thai government uh, denied the allegation, but the, the situation at the border is worse and as more internally displaced people streamed into the region. So actually this, uh, the, the, the border, the, the humanitarian crisis uh, as, uh, uh, through to the border, cross border, it's not new. We have to be advocate and uh, uh, you know, uh, try to advocate and uh, call for the international include ICN many long years. And also we have, uh, we have uh, raised the voice and the challenge uh, it, uh, through to many different channels as well. But today we didn't get any action, especially in Antia uh, 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 country. So this is what we really need uh, and what we really uh, 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 want to see the action from the ASEAN as well. So what we call it for the international community include ASEAN, um, to facilitate immediately uh, international uh, 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 humanitarian aid assistance, include cross-border aid to the eternally displaced people in ethnic areas. So, and also we also call for the uh, uh, limitation uh, lim uh, uh, to reduce or uh, a limitation of the transportation or you know 
uh, to to open the flow of opportunity or the chance for the the worker or civil, civil society that work for the humanitarian aid because whoever work for the humanitarian aid watched by the military spy and the military um, uh, and also uh, follow and uh, always uh, threats or some of that they were arrested arrest. So this is also a, a, ch a big challenge that the worker has faced uh, at the moment. So we have a uh, across the country, uh, some uh, like in the India border, IDP uh, in, in India border and IDP in the, as why in like uh, even not China, in the China, but across the China border and in the uh, Thai border. So there's the most uh, IDPs, they are crosses in there. They, so they, they are security and safety and then they are also humanitarian aid assistance need urgently. So. This is what we are calling for the international community, include ATSIA. Thank you so much. Thank you, no, sir, sir, for reminding us that the humanitarian crisis is becoming intensified along the border areas, including along the Thai Burmese border. Um, that um, the this is basically intensifying the legacy of decades of conflict and deprivation. But on the on the the plus on the on the on the the good news side is the, the existence and the op ongoing operations for an, a very strong network of community-based organizations and civil society organizations that have been working for decades that have a track record of working effectively despite the threat and the limited resources, um, and and who enjoy who have the capacity, the access, and the trust of local communities. Um, and, this, and, and as the situation intensifies, we must not forget that a key point in the ASEAN five-point consensus was about actually addressing the humanitarian crisis, which is why it is my pleasure to welcome um, two speakers from Indonesia who are actually experts uh, and and also at least one inside view. Um, and um, before I start and before I ask you the question, I will answer the question I asked, which is I started paying attention to ASEAN because of human rights crackdowns uh, in, in, in Singapore opera, opera, uh, Operation Spectrum in May to 1987 and Malaysian's uh, Operasi Lalang in October 1987, when it became clear that ASEAN agencies were sharing intelligence in order to attack human rights defenders. So, um, so I, I did answer the question that I'm going to ask all the other speakers. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome Adelina, Ibu Adelina Kamal, who is, um, who is um, a senior associate senior fellow at ICA, ICAS and, um, and also um, a veteran of the ASEAN structure and former executive director of the AHA Center, the AHA, uh, ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Center, which was supposed to be the one delivering aid under the five point consensus. So um, over to you, uh, Ibu Adelina, uh, for the next 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ibu Devi. You can hear me, right? <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for inviting me, colleagues, uh, at the uh, ASEAN Parliamentarian for Human, Human Rights, APHR. Uh, Pak Charla, Santiago, Ibu Veronica, thank you for inviting me to join you and speak in this platform. Uh, I'm actually still speechless after listening to our uh, women, uh, the young women uh, uh, of Myanmar. And I hope that I, I still have the voice, because it's, it's really uh, something that uh, touch uh, the bottom of my heart. And, and if this voice doesn't touch your heart and doesn't move you, then you should ask yourself whether you are human. <clears throat> so um, disclaimer. Uh, Ibu Debi, what I'm going to convey are strictly my personal views uh, and opinions and do not represent the organization that I'm 
uh, affiliated with, that is the ISIS uh, in Singapore, and also the organization that I worked before. To answer your question, I started paying attention to ASEAN when I fetched my uh, good friend at the ASEAN Secretariat and learned that there was a vacancy. I was a fresh uh, graduate. And I worked at the ASEAN Secretariat in December, starting in December, 1994. And I was in the system in the ASEAN Secretariat for 22 years, serving five secretaries general of ASEAN, including uh, Dr. Surin, uh, may he rest in peace. And then I moved out uh, and I left the ASEAN Secretary to lead the AHA Center for almost five years until last August 2021. Um, I have always loved ASEAN, but my love is a tough love. For those who know me before, I have always been critical inside. And I continue my love even I'm uh, working at the outside. So I'll start. Um, should I start now or you ask me questions first? But perhaps I should <laughs> just um, respond to the concept note that the organizer prepared for this event. And there was this uh, 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 a question and actually it's a statement. Um, the APHR mentioned in the concept note that the ASEAN five-point consensus released by the ASEAN leaders last year in April had failure built in from the start. I disagree with that. Yes, Veronica, I disagree because I think ASEAN has failed long before the five-point consensus were released. Why? Being in the system for almost three decades, I appreciate the effort of the ASEAN leaders and the ASEAN foreign ministers, the Indonesian president and the foreign minister for organizing the event, for getting together the nine ASEAN leaders and the junta in April. It required a lot of effort, right? But ASEAN has not been designed and is not designed to deal with a political crisis. It is not fit for that purpose. And I should underline that the Myanmar crisis is a political crisis first and foremost, with major, major human rights violation and uh, serious humanitarian consequences. So it started with, as a political crisis and it already challenges the relevance and credibility of ASEAN as a regional organization built over 50 years ago. But let me ask you, colleagues and audience, were you even surprised that the coup, the authentic coup happened? Did you know that it would happen if you were a political analyst and you have been monitoring, analyzing, watching the situation in Myanmar for decades, you would know that it's a matter of time. So someone said, I was teaching uh, incident command system <laughs> some days ago um, to the university uh, students. And I found this uh, quote, it says, the most serious failure of leadership is the failure to foresee, to anticipate. That's why I dis disagree with the statement that the five-point consensus has a built-in uh, failure uh, from the start. That is, from April, it has actually a uh, failure built in even before. And that's why I wrote an article published by the CSIS Indonesia, where Dr. Lina worked and also Jakarta Post, where I wrote that there is no crisis mechanism in ASEAN. It's not even AHA Center, and I will mention why. It doesn't mean that ASEAN doesn't have anything. If you look at the ASEAN Charter, Article 7.2.D, it says that ASEAN leaders 
can discuss emergency situation affecting ASEAN, right? Through a summit, through a leaders meeting. And they did that, but only two years, uh, two months later <laughs> in April. And that article 7.2.D, look it up, is open-ended. You show it, you show it to anyone. I show it to my husband. It's open-ended. It's open for any interpretation and it can lead you to any uh, uh, scenarios, right? And I think it's dangerous because again, you know that is going to happen. It's already boiling, but we are not actually anticipating it enough. When we talk about incident management, when we talk about crisis management, it's not only the management of the consequences, but the ability to anticipate and to uh, prepare and to build a mechanism. And in ASEAN, we don't have a crisis mechanism for that purpose. Now, and particularly for conflict-induced crisis. Now, someone asked me, right after the ASEAN leaders meeting in April 2021, and I was still with the AHA Center, Ibu Adelina, why did it take so long for the AHA Center to deliver aid? Isn't that point four of the five point consensus that says ASEAN shall provide humanitarian assistance through the AHA Center enough? Well, you got the instruction directly from the ASEAN leaders. That's the highest direct to you, AHA Center. Well, then I ask that person another question. What are the leaders' intent being a good soldier? What do the leaders want to achieve? If you want us to deliver boxes at the Yangon airport, easy, it can be done fast and it has been done many times in natural hazard disasters. But for that, we have a regional mechanism. We have the standard operating procedure. It's clear, it's management by objective. The, the intent is clear because it's clearly laid out in the so-called ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response. What is success? What does success look like? Clear. Therefore, the first question that I ask by anyone who asked me whether AHA Center is preparing, and yes, AHA Center was already preparing for that eventuality, although I was hesitant, was on that particular, what is the leader's intent, okay? Because I, I was not clear and I'm still not clear right now, okay? So the stalemate, and now, uh, and recently I, I wrote an article for ISIS uh, in Singapore, and um, it talks about the current humanitarian stalemate. It's now a stalemate, and the stalemate has been partly, and I should say largely, due to political paralysis that hinders response and access to the most affected people. How do you think a health center or any humanitarian actors would come into Yangon? By talking to, 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 to the junta, it's not only applicable to the AHA center, any humanitarian actors, if we go the classic Ben 8 way, we'll have to deal with the SAC if we accept that approach. Now, then I ask the question again, do you know what humanitarian assistance is? Do we know? Do we have common understanding on that? Humanitarian assistance or humanitarian action by definition is to save life, reduce the suffering of the affected people and protect the dignity of the most vulnerable population. Remember that. And that requires access, requires those providing assistance to ask the people 
what do you need and how do you want us to to deliver the assistant it's not about us it's about them okay so i think in this part of the region and also other parts of the region humanitarian assistance is defined as delivering relief items delivering boxes at the airport only humanitarian assistance or humanitarian actions also includes policy diplomacy negotiating access delivering and providing assistance and protection and unfortunately this last two delivering aid and protection of the people are often compromised because humanitarian aid is supposed to be apolitical but often politicized you have heard it oh humanitarian assistant entry point hanging fruit low hanging fruit humanitarian assistant cannot be your breathing space cannot be the diplomatic sweetener it's it's largely political paralysis provide and negotiate for the access first and therefore it's a pity that a special envoy is, was only appointed in august after i left <laughs> how could how could we the soldier come and provide the access if there is there, there there's no negotiation for the access what happened in young in cyclone nargis asean was able to provide that access push for that access and others come in provided the bridge so we must understand this first it's not a matter of just dropping the box is it what you want okay so you don't have we don't have a, a crisis mechanism we have all these uh, problematic you know uh, issues aha center is not independent it, uh, and it is created that way for natural disaster with indian ocean tsunami in mind and there's nothing wrong with that for nature disaster response when the government is willing and able to provide assistance but the situation is different so you cannot superimpose the current regional arrangements created for a tsunami for conflict because the designs were for natural hazard induced disasters where the focal point of the affected country sitting in the governing board where they actually approve the kind of assistance to be delivered where they direct and control assistance so if we follow the regional mechanism for natural hazard disaster i don't want to call it even natural disaster for nature has a disaster we call it the asean agreement disaster management emergency response and use a center which is the operational focal point then we will have this problem we will you, we will have to actually be in their level playing field okay so in the second article and i encourage you to uh, read it if, uh, if you haven't am i still within 10 minutes i i offer three scenarios first classic ben 8 approach this is like the preferred way for now for ASEAN for AHA center and perhaps for the international humanitarian community it's like sticking plaster on the wounded wounds uh, on the wounds right um and and this is the classic way of doing things but in doing so you will still have you 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 will still be caught in between because you still have to deal with the SAC with the state administration council you have to be very innovative about it but at the risk of being rejected your assistant will be rejected by the people because trust is the cornerstone of humanitarian assistance okay second scenario so so, so before i i talk about the second and third scenario the first scenario if you choose that first scenario understand the consequences understand the consequences okay and that has that has been actually pointed out and it has already happened save the children the people 
uh, for, of the safe, uh, 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 save the children killed already. The, the, the space is shrinking. The humanitarian space is shrinking. You have to accept first, if you choose the first scenario, to work in a constrained and contained space and that the humanitarian objective will not be met. And that is addressing the needs of the most vulnerable people. That's the first scenario. Second, pragmatic, like what the Chinese did, providing aid, COVID-19 vaccine to both the junta and the rebels. I don't really like it, but being pragmatic is also perhaps preferred approach because then you only protect your people and you've got to protect your own people if you, if you share borders with Myanmar. You've got to do so. And that can we can do that by applying humanitarian corridors, buffer zone, so that there won't be any spillover of refugee flows. It's for the good of the country. It's for your own national interest. If you don't care about the Myanmar people, at least care for your own people. That's primary Third, humanitarian resistance. And people, Humanitarian resistance, meaning that when we provide aid, right, we will provide the aid through the networks that the, the people already trust. And this basically are the resistant movements, the resistant groups at the border. And I think that is the most effective way because people are fleeing. People are already moving to the borders so rather than you, you go to Yangon or Napito, work within your own level playing field, create your own level playing field. And that means support humanitarian resistance. You will be accused, supporters of this, you will be accused of supporting resistance and prioritizing aid. But doing so will make sure that the humanitarian objectives are met and will help sustainable uh, peace as well, S uh, resilience, uh, resilience of the people and sustainable peace. So you've got these three scenarios, not to mention there is a possibility of another psychonarchist. So after given the scenarios, what do you choose? What do we choose ASEAN and the international humanitarian community? Read my article for the recommendation. Also, otherwise, Ibu Lina, Dr. Lina won't be able to uh, 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 speak. Ibu Thank Ibu. you so much, uh, Ibu Adelina. Actually, uh, Ibu Adelina, if you can um, put the link to your article in the chat for all, that would be amazing. And thank you for uh, walking us through basically the structural challenges and the severe lack of political will in ASEAN to adequately address the crisis in Myanmar, not just the political, but also the humanitarian crisis. Um, the three options, the classic band-aid, um, the pragmatic approach, and also um, uh, an uh, outcome-based approach in terms of working with local CBOs and resistance organizations to, en to ensure that aid reaches those who need it most. But also reminding us all that um, uh, about the two national staff of Save the Children who were massacred along with nearly 40 other internally displaced people in, at Christmas time. Um, and, and these were all unarmed civilians who were killed by the Burmese military junta, who originally admitted to, to the massacre. And, um, and but also reminding us too, that the humanitarian crisis as a result of this political uh, crisis, this human rights crisis, pre represents not just a, a, a crisis for the people of Burma, Myanmar, but also a severe challenge for regional human security. And on that note, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Lina Alexandra, head of the Department of International Relations at CSIS and coordinator for CSIS Myanmar Initiative Program. This, we are going to extend the time of the webinar so that um, we can yeah. hear from Dr. Lina and have Q&A, but don't forget the question. When did you start paying attention to ASEAN and why? 
All right. Thank you very much, Debbie. I think after listening to a very inspiring um, presentation from Ibu Adelina, not really much to, to add. I actually still want to hear more from her. I think I believe all of you as well. But anyway, I first I try to answer uh, uh, the question from Debbie. Uh, I, my answer probably is the least um, interesting one because well, I studied international relations in the re in Indonesia, of course, and ASEAN, as we know, is the, the only regional organizations that we have in South, Southeast Asia. So I started to develop my interest on ASEAN, of course, from through uh, from my study. And then I joined CSIS since 2002. And this is actually the mandate from the office in CSIS because CSIS is actually voicing out the perspective, the Indonesian perspective um, on inter international uh, international relations in the region, and in in which ASEAN, of course, is the the first tier of attention that we should develop. So, if you ask all researchers in in CSIS from the, the from the two departments, at least Department of Economics and Department of International Relations, all researchers, we have to to like ASEAN, we have to love ASEAN, basically, you know. And I agree with Ibu Adelina, it's always a tough love that we develop because we are researchers. We, we criticize ASEAN because we love ASEAN. So, uh, and on that note, of course, uh, I also agree with Ibu Adelina that uh, when we say about, um, when we say ASEAN is a failure, it's, a, it's actually our failure as well. Although we know it's, basically the governments. We always criticize ASEAN is always is, is being so elitist. But, and then ASEAN has this kind of vision of people to people connection, which is very good actually. But until now, we, we are still seeing this as uh, a project in progress, you know? Um, so we are like from the civil society, especially we keep reminding our governments, our leaders, that this is the thing that you are envisioning. You put it in a, 2020 vision and now you have post 2025 about to to have tw post 2025 uh, vision and I believe the people to people connectivity is still there uh, making ASEAN as a people based organization so um, and also uh, thank you also for the um, from the for, for the uh, from the notes from Pinsa Sunli and uh, I express my um, uh, deep empathy, of course, and I agree with uh, Dr. Adelina that if you're a human being, you should at least feel uh, and, and empathize with our um, uh, brother and sisters in, in Myanmar, and especially with the young women who struggle very much until now um, um, against the coup. So um, I don't think I have, well, I have making a lot of notes here, but I don't know, I think I prefer to have more discussion rather than um, saying too much. But the first point that I'm going to make is um, on the issue that Ibu Adelina mentioned that uh, about the, 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 the role of our center. We in CSI actually, um, and we are going to publish this uh, quite soon in the website on our policy paper about uh, so-called ASEAN office or ASEAN mission on Myanmar. Uh, for, for many people, I think even because we, we share this with our respective government as well, I know it's a kind of a lofty idea. It's a, such a grand idea, you know, because what we are thinking from the very beginning, when we see the ASEAN five point, five point consensus, we know this is a kind of a combination between a wishing hope and some strategy there. You know, the three points, of course, cessation of violence, delivery of human assistance, and facilitation of dialogue. That's the, the wishing hope, the expectation of what ASEAN would like to see to happen in Myanmar. And the other two is create uh, the special envoy visit, including the appointment of the special envoy. Um, and those, those kind of um, initial strategy that ASEAN thing uh, will be uh, useful to push for the for the three goals, the three of objectives that ASEAN would like to see. Uh, and we in CSI immediately have a um, series of discussions. First, of course, with the um, 
other scholars in our network in ASEAN ISIS, and also our own internal discussion in CSI. And we come up with this kind of um, idea, you know, uh, that we should. Of course, the only reference, even until now, I think the only reference is the, 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 the mission that ASEAN had before in the 90s. Again, we all agree it's not apple to apple, it's not comparable, it's a totally different situation that we are facing now in ASEAN. It's not a natural disaster. As Ibu Adelina mentioned earlier, this is an internal political crisis that we are facing now. But again, um, what we are proposing actually at that time to operationalize the five point consensus, how to make it um, um, an implement, implementable one. And we certainly noticed from the very beginning what Ibu Adelina mentioned. Despite our center being mentioned in the five point consensus, we know from the very beginning, this, this, uh, although we know that as our center has the capacity to deliver boxes, because this this is uh, this uh, of course this is a coordinating um, um, center for humanitarian assistance, but our center does not have the mandate, and we know the structure of our center with the governing council, it's really impossible, because the the troublemaker, the representative of the troublemaker is still there. How can you you talk, you know? And that is really the problem that if we are going through um, that uh, scenario, of course, then we will need to talk with the military. And this is, some, this is something that we from the very beginning is, is um, having a dilemma with. Uh, to be honest with you, we as a think tank, we talk with everyone. We talk with everyone. And we try to approach from different angles. And I have to share with you at this point, we don't think we, we need to talk with all with, with, with all the all the stakeholders, meaning there's no point talking with the military anymore, to be honest. It's um but again, um okay, back to the structure. So what we propose is uh, because Ibu Anelina mentioned, okay, if you wanna have, if you wanna let our center to work, you should give a kind of a bigger framework to protect, and more importantly, to explain what do you want our center to do. And that's why we propose a kind of um this ASEAN mission in Myanmar, where the special envoy first is not only serving as the as the chairs special envoy. It should serve as the ASEAN special envoy, meaning it should also serve as the head of the, of the mission for Myanmar, which directs or supervises at least two task forces and one office, one small office, which is dialogue office. And this humanitarian, humanitarian um, assistance task force is under the more, under the supervision of the special info. So in terms of access to get into the country and deliver the humanitarian assistance, this, this should be the, um, the task or the obligation, obligation of the special info. And, and I think when we totally agree with Ibu Adelina that this should not be a, the entry point. I mean, like the humanitarian system should not be uh, placed as the entry point. The entry point should be a kind of monitoring mission. This is the, another lofty idea. I know we have been debated, we have been uh, criticized by many people. How do you create this kind of monitoring mission? We know, but if ASEAN wants the cessation of violence, how do you want to be, uh, uh, how do you want it to be uh, on the ground without the monitoring mission? You know, how do you monitor that every everyone actually restrain themselves? And again, this is the major challenge for ASEAN. We don't have the so-called ASEAN peacekeeping force, right? So 
but again, you want the session of uh, session of hostilities or violence uh, to be at place. Then you have to you have to have this kind of of situ uh, of, of of the mission, like monitoring mission. So you create a kind of space for these humanitarian um, workers, agencies to work on the ground to deliver um, humanitarian assistance. And I agree again with uh, Ibu Adelina that we from the very beginning we don't want our center if it actually works to just drop boxes at the airport. This is not, I think, uh, what we envision uh, uh, of uh, uh, what our, our center should do. So we want them to go to assess the situation, to assess the needs, what the people, all, all people in Myanmar actually in need. But again, we send the, we share this uh, idea, no response as predicted, of course. Um, and I think uh, to give notes um, to what Ibu Adelina mentioned uh, about the three options. Um, I think we should work on the last options about the human assistance that Ibu Adelina um, shared with us just now. Um, these options, I know it's very, very challenging because it requires total disengagement with the junta um, and supporting the existing um, community-based efforts. I think what we need to hear more, probably some people, um, some participants here can, can share with us even more on the capacities um, that uh, community-based organizations um, uh, have currently. Um, because we from outside, I don't know, maybe Adelina or Debbie have more information on this. But what I learned from um, different activities in CSI is we know that there are quite a number of groups that, that, uh, that are actually working on the ground inside Myanmar. For example, I heard about the charity groups. I heard about the religious groups, especially the Buddhist connection. I heard, of course, about the ethnic-based groups providing social services and other human systems. And about the private sectors, what we hear now is always the pressures toward um, MNCs, like multiple national corporations or big companies, basically, from outside. Uh, um, people keep pressures to, uh, to them to stop business with the Myanmar military. But we want to know also about the businesses, the local businesses in Myanmar. What are their roles? How, how, how do they play their, uh, their roles until now? But of course, we have to put notes on these private sectors because again, they are, um, of course, as companies, they are profit seeking. But we know that they, they, they have this kind of corporate social responsibility, things like that, that we might tap on that. Um, to, to support this kind of um, um, humanitarian assistance um, effort. And also one point that I learned uh, from different activities in CISIS as well, uh, about the, the role of diaspora. Uh, Myanmar is this diaspora um, in many countries. Um, one example, I think what I heard is quite active is in, in Japan, the one in Japan. Uh, they work and they created a kind of a crowd find, uh, crowdfunding. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you have heard about Just Myanmar, Jap Japanese urgent support team for Myanmar um, to support um, CDM, I think. Um, and they work through, through, uh, through Thailand and also create a kind of an international network uh, with the Buddhists, um, things like that. Um, so I think, well, this is already March and next month is going to be the anniversary of the five point consensus. And as Charles mentioned in the beginning, no progress um, whatsoever so far. So I think with that, I think uh, we need to build more pressures on ASEAN. One year, nothing happens. And I remember in the last, um, I think with the, I, I forgot the, the event, but anyway, just uh, last week, I think, or two weeks ago, um, 
I think my recommendation is we really need to pressure ASEAN to make a bolder standpoint. Because the special envoy, even Cambodia saying they're already hitting the wall. And with that, I think the point is really to put pressure for ASEAN to really make the clearer standpoint. If they can't work anymore, if this SAC, the military keep closing the door, then put pressure on them. Okay, you don't want to uh, give access to us? Okay, we explore, we give more platforms, we give more um, rooms for the pro-democratic groups. We talk more with them and show it, right? So, and that will create, I think, that will create some pressures at least. Because now the military, they, they know that ASEAN leaders will not talk with the pro-democratic groups. So that's why they said, okay, whatever. We stop talking to you. You, you won't talk to, to, to other stakeholders, to other parties. So I think with that, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, and then I look forward for the discussion. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Dr. Lina. So um, it's uh, very interesting to note that um, internally within ASEAN, those who are committed to regionalism and the effectiveness of ASEAN are very alarmed um, that the five point consensus has not been really implemented or delivered and that ASEAN has not done enough to make sure that happens. And so we have the proposal of the ASEAN mission for Myanmar to actually push forward on implementation of the five point consensus and to, to also generate leverage to, to, to if, the, if, the, if the junta doesn't want to dialogue or doesn't want to move on this, that, that ASEAN needs to step up its engagement with the other legitimate and credible stakeholders in this picture, including the pro-democracy movement, community-based organizations, ethnic groups, and of course, the national unity government, the NUG. And this is particularly important given that ASEAN's partners the EU, other dialogue partners, and even the UN Security Council have expressed support for implementation of the five-point consensus. So here we already start to look at the, um, the importance, not just of the five-point consensus as a document, but actually operationalizing it and, um, and creating the, the leverage and the pressure to, to shift this situation. So now we have um, Nosa's, uh, uh, we had an impassioned and inspiring speech from um, Tinza Shunlei from Sisters to Sisters to commemorate Angel. We also had a very supportive um, um, and, and ally uh, support from um, uh, APHR, ASEAN Parliamentarians and Human Rights Chair, um, 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 Charles Santiago, Member of Parliament for Klang. Um, we had a presentation from NOSESA from the Women's League of Burma showing the intense need, but also what community-based organizations and ethnic organizations and women organizations have been doing to address the humanitarian crisis. We had a very feisty presentation from Ibu Adelina, who, um, um, who, who expressed her tough love approach, uh, which is, I think all of us have that tough love approach, as Dr. Lina said, um, and actually out outlining the three options, the band-aid, the pragmatic, or the actual outcome-oriented, the effective option in terms of making sure humanitarian assistance is delivered to all who need it. And, um, and Dr. Lina um, talking about some of the structural options, how to, how to try and operationalize and make sure the situation shifts. But also Dr. Lina asked um, about capacity and the profile of CBOs and diaspora and CSOs operating in the country who are doing humanitarian assistance. And of course, if you were to Google it, it would be quite difficult to find that mapping because a lot of these organizations have been operating in a situation of conflict and uh, persecution uh, for decades. In fact, one of the organizations, the Backpack Health Worker Team, where med people were trained as medics 
and then um, equipped with backpacks of medications to go into war zones to provide aid to uh, war affected communities became targeted. As soon as you're seen wearing a backpack, the military would kill you. They would shoot you on sight. So, um, so that's also why some of these organizations do not uh, specifically name themselves, but there is going to be, I think, a, a confidential space uh, where this can be examined. This mapping has to be examined in a confidential space um, because of security issues and uh, seeing as how these service providers, these people who are saving lives are in themselves targeted. But having said that, we are very lucky that we have in the room, Dr. Vid Suvavanich, who is a long time um, expert on public health in Burma and the border areas. So um, I'd like to invite Dr. Vid to share Observing, of course, um, security and confidentiality. This is a Facebook Live, so it's a public event. Um, um, examples where ethnic health organizations have been more competent and effective than state agencies uh, in the country. And what that implies in terms of the possibility of scaling up humanitarian assistance to these organizations. Over to you, Dr. Vitt. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Debbie, and all the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm not going to add a lot just to save time for uh, a discussion because I think there's more that we can uh, we, we can flesh out uh, in that. But um, just to, uh, to tap a couple of things that previous panelists have said, um, like Adelina's humanitarian resistance, I may start using that term, by the way, um, and to tap what Nasser and others have also said that you know, this concept of doing uh, uh, aid through community groups is not new. It's been going on for decades. Um, I'm dating myself a little bit, but you know, when I first started working with them in tw uh, 20 years ago, actually a lot of these, uh, these programs were already in place. You know? And so by the time I got here, it was piggybacking and growing something that was already, already uh, on the ground, providing services uh, uh, to the most to the most vulnerable populations, those with the greatest needs. In that time, of course, there, there are many, many parallels to what's going on in Burma today. There was civil conflict, there was widespread human rights abuses, there was lack of access to care, and that manifested itself in, in a myriad ways, in myriad ways, including in public health. <clears throat> and one of the first uh, things that I was um, uh, uh, faced with over here working with my colleagues is a measles outbreak in Karen State amongst uh, in an, an, an IDP community, a community where they had no access to official health care services, where aid agencies did not have a presence. They had to rely on community organizations pretty much solely for their care or uh, do it through traditional healers or, or uh, uh, buy their own medicines or in many cases go without. So there was a measles outbreak. Um, measles can look like a lot of things. Uh, so what my colleagues quickly did was gather samples, brought them to the border area where they could be confirmed as measles, procured vaccines, took them back to these communities and do a catch-up campaign. And ultimately, after a couple of weeks, uh, turned this around. And by the end of it, I don't remember now offhand how many um, people were affected because this was probably around 15 years or so ago. But um, I want to say maybe one or 2,000 people, and the number of deaths was ultimately less than 10%, uh, 10 people. Um, but uh, uh, there are a couple of things that I learned through this experience. And one of them is that the limitations of actually uh, biomedical interventions. The vaccine is great at preventing measles, but why do these populations uh, not have access? No. And it's pennies, as you know, how uh, these things, are, these interventions are cheap. And there are very few medical interventions that save more lives for less money than vaccination campaigns. Why couldn't they access it? And at the end of the day, when my colleagues came back and I was able to chat with them, uh, they were able to access most of the communities with their catch up vaccination campaigns. But I remember one of them telling me that one community they could not reach was because it was far too dangerous. The junta soldiers were there. Uh, it was too dangerous for the health workers. 
Um, and you know, fast forward now almost 20 years later, and we're back in the same situation. Uh, just to remind folks who may be tuning in that Burma today is one of the most dangerous places to be a health worker. There have been hundreds of attacks on health facilities, on health personnel. People have been arrested, tortured, and killed, and driven into hiding uh, just for providing services. And um, uh, in any event, uh, uh, the other thing I learned from this is that, um, you know, the, and it was something the communities already knew well, that they, sh they cannot wait for governments to respond. They cannot wait for ASEAN to respond. If they really wanted to care for their own peoples, they had to roll up their sleeves and do it. So we did it. You know, it was already built into the system. Um, it was good for the communities, but it was also good to reiterate something that I think Debbie said. Uh, from an infectious disease and public health standpoint, it was good for Thailand because some of these affected communities were a day away from, from, from the Thai border. So, you know, by controlling outbreaks like this, you can help prevent some of the potential spillover effects that of course will affect the public health security of communities, not just in Burma, but in Thailand as well. Um, but I think there's one thing that now that I've been here long enough that that's unappreciated um, in that like when you invest in these health systems, you also look for the long term. So now many of us are dealing with COVID, we're dealing with COVID responses, but you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. When it comes to things like vaccine administration, cold chains, well, they already learned how to do this from, from, from examples like this. So it helps build community resiliency. So again, if I can just reiterate, um, uh, if we wanted to, to uh, deliver humanitarian assistance to some of the most um, uh, disproportionately affected communities in Burma, especially today, because we know most of the displaced are actually along Burma's borders. If we want to protect the health security of, uh, of, of the world now, but especially regional countries, uh, it would behoove us to uh, expand and build upon these links and really invest in, in, uh, in community-based health services. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. V. Um, this has been an amazing ASEAN experience for me because we've had inputs from, um, uh, from people who are Thai, Burman, Karen, Indonesian, Filipino, Malaysian. So we actually, this is actually quite a strong, this is a very ASEAN oriented, both in topic and in representation in speakers. Um, we I haven't seen, noticed any questions so far. So I wanted to open the floor for one minute intervention from our speakers, um, uh, starting from the top. Uh, Tinza Shunlei, would you like, do you want to ask a question or um, share your final words for one minute? Okay, yes, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I continue to appreciate um, your continued solidarity with the people of Myanmar, not just um, in our you know, difficult time, but also in the past as well for your uh, continued work from the Myanmar. So um, Myanmar is having a um, serious situation, basically in the border areas, the numbers of the IDP is growing and we should not forget. Um, also, we must remember different uh, uh, difficulty part, different situation, because even though we have more IDPs, that IDPs um, having um, the, from the different ethnic communities are suffering the most. So uh, we also need to keep in mind that that different struggle between different classes and different genders and different um, society. So that would be my last remark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tinza. And uh, Narcissa from Women's League of Burma. Um, thank you so much. Uh, um, I really appreciate all speakers um, have uh, speak very strong point and also having solidarity with us, especially also humanitarian uh, crisis issue as well. So uh, I just want to say it's, uh, the time uh, times to list is ours. So uh, especially at CR cannot go alone. So it has to work with uh, people and especially uh, if a uh, focus is on the uh, humanitarian aid, 
uh, you will have to work with the local CVOCS or direct lead, and then you will have to listen and uh, stretch your, co your cooperation with uh, local CVOCS or who, who are handed the uh, humanitarian aid. So this is, uh, we urgently need, especially the cross-border aid. So uh, this is uh, need to take action immediately. Uh, and that the, the, the safety and the security of the CVOCS or, or especially who are working for the humanitarian aid crisis, it also need protection of the safety and the security as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, no, sir, sir. Ibu Adelina. Thank you very much. Um, I'll use the remaining time to offer uh, my recommendation for the recommendation. First, stop wasting time. Disengage the junta at all levels of ASEAN decision-making, in particular, the humanitarian track. If you still want to, if we still want to engage with the SAC, with the State Administration Council, do it through the political track. Do your job first. Fix the political paralysis, but also ensure that you talk to all relevant stakeholders. But for the humanitarian, ASEAN minus X, ASEAN 9 should be applied. Otherwise, don't ask AHA Center to do the job. Don't ask the Rambutan tree, that is AHA Center, to produce durian fruit, unless you give them the prerequisites in line with the humanitarian objective and humanitarian principles. Otherwise, stop wasting time. Work with those that the people already trust. And there are examples of that. Let's start strategizing and stop doing, you know, talking. Start strategizing. And we know already who to talk to. And we have to be very strategic about it and also tactical. Third, focus on, uh, at the border. Don't, again, don't waste your time. Focus at the border. It's already one year. Enough. Focus at the border, prepare for the humanitarian borders. Look at what the Europeans uh, are doing right now for the Ukrainian, they're open their borders. If you don't want to open your borders, at least provide assistance at the borders. By doing so, you protect your own people. Okay, in doing so, let's gather the thoughts of the ASEAN people and our partners. Let's work openly with the United Nations, the ICRC, the Red Cross and humanitarian partners, but ASEAN should lead the way. ASEAN should actually be leading the way. And we should create that buffer zone with ASEAN leading and the UN. But if ASEAN cannot do it, it's time for the people of ASEAN to do it. I'm calling for a solidarity movement of the people to people. That's Thank the you, Ibu. for the governments. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. Don't waste time. Open the borders. Look at what's happened, what, what Europe ha how Europe has responded to Ukraine. That's what we should be doing. And another, and a meme is emerging from my brain, which is don't ask the Rambutan tree to produce durian. Um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Lina, one minute. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Uh, of course, you don't want to uh, ask the rambutan tree to bear durian fruit, but if, for ASEAN, anything is actually possible. If the leaders, they want to change the rambutan tree into a durian tree to produce durian, they can if they want to. Uh, so basically, that's why we push for the review of the ASEAN Charter, for example, to really push. I know ASEAN is not designed to deal with the internal political crisis, but this is exactly the problem, the challenge that ASEAN needs to face to be able to, be, uh, to become a relevant and credible organization in the future. Uh, and one point, if I may ask, because Dr. Fit, I think going um, to um, share um, his point as well, is it possible if there is a kind of um, um, a closed door workshop or something, to talk with this um, community-based organization. 
because uh, that's one point that I raised, right, Debbie, um, that we want to know the mapping, actually, if that's possible. Thank you. Okay, I see Dr. Vid nodding and I will, uh, as an old friend, I read his mind and he will say yes. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're running out of time. We have actually run out of time. I'm so sorry. We got a last minute question from the Southeast Asian globe. How does the Cambodian chairmanship of ASEAN impact the ASEAN response to the crisis? I think that is going to be the topic of the next webinar. I would propose that as a topic for the next webinar to mark the one year anniversary of the five point consensus. And on this note, I would like to hand over to our host, Veronica Pedrosa um, of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights to say the goodbye, to wrap us up and say the goodbyes, and also to assure us that all the links to Ibu Adelina's um, articles will also be listed in the comments to the Facebook Live so that we don't lose it. Thank you, everybody. And don't forget, there was live tweeting at uh, ASEAN MP Twitter handle. So please go there and retweet. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for allowing me to moderate this session. It's actually thank been you. our privilege and honor to have you, Debbie, and all our panelists. Thank you very much indeed, Adelina Kamal, Norsa Sir, Dr. Vit, Dr. Lina, and Tinza Shunlegi. Um, there's very little to add. We will definitely clip up some of your comments to share on social media and also to share the recording will be on the Facebook page. So please spread the word. If you know anyone who would benefit from knowing the kind of things that we talked about this time, um, you know, that please do go ahead and share those links. Um, also, we will be following up on what we've discussed here with further activities at ASEAN um, Parliamentarians for Human Rights, please get in touch if ever you need to, um, if you want to follow up on that or you want to participate, you have any questions, we're happy to network you all. Thanks very much. Let's remember the legacy of Angel Jalsin as well. And remember all the people who are fighting to try and bring a better future for uh, Myanmar. And for, to all of you for all your hard work, many thanks. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.